Well, I want to apologize right now. It's late yesterday or early yesterday evening. Got this chest cold that just and it just settled right in and so hopefully it's I don't get any of you sick, but hopefully too it, as I try and talk that uh it's not too distracting. So we are in our fourth Sunday of Advent and as we uh, heard from Dodd's words this morning as they read, this is, the fourth Sunday of Advent is the theme of joy, or is the theme of love, sorry. And, and we're all pretty familiar with, with this term of love and what it means. And, and I think sometimes too, though we're so quick to dismiss and not really think about some of the things surrounding this idea of love. And so this morning's message is what's love got to do with it? And there may be a few of you that all of a sudden, yeah, a couple of you, that song comes to mind, and I will do you a favor and not sing it for you. Come on. New. But what's love got to do with it? And it's, it's this point of this question, the heart of this question, that really needs to drive us back to the heart of who God is. And so we're going to look at a couple of passages of Scripture. We're going to bounce around a little bit as well. I've put slides up, and hopefully that will help you follow along. But I want to kind of give some context for where we're going to be looking at and what we're looking at. So by the time that Jesus began his ministry, the Jews had accumulated hundreds of laws. By some count, 613 different laws. And these religious leaders, they tried to distinguish between major and minor laws, and some taught that all laws were equally binding, and that it was dangerous to make any distinctions between minor and major laws. So as we read this text here in Mark chapter 12, I want you to keep this in mind, that this teacher's question that he asked Jesus could have and probably did provoke some controversy among these religious groups. But Jesus' answer is the key to to all of this fitting together. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to it. We'll have it on the screen as well. Mark chapter 12, 28 through 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. It's kind of interesting to to make a note here that, that Jesus ties these two commandments together. And he ties them together to summarize the rest of the commandments. To ask which is the most important, though, was a question that really revealed that this teacher didn't really get it. Because what he was trying to get at is which one's more important over the other. But what Jesus was trying to communicate is they're both sides of the same coin. You can't love God without loving others, and you can't love others without loving God. And so he's trying to get them to see that. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. This is what Jesus was, was referring to. They were very familiar with it. And as I was reading through that, I looked over and I saw a couple of you following along, kind of reciting the same words, because you know it too. And so they were very familiar. They probably would have said it right along with him. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, it says it again. Do not revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your Lord 
or love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. He's tying these things together. But as we think about that, we think about, too, that all of their, and we tend to do this, too, we like a nice, nice set of rules, a nice list, a nice, nice framework of what we can do and what we shouldn't do, right? It gives us, I don't know, it makes us feel comfortable knowing what we should do and not do, right? And so these, these teachers of the law operated really well inside that. But Jesus begins turning this on their head because they were missing the point. Trying to follow all these laws, 613, again, by some count, where Jesus takes these two commandments and summarizes all 613. Isn't that amazing? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. God's laws were not intended to be this burdensome thing. It can be reduced to these two simple principles. These are commands from the Old Testament, and when you love God completely and care for others as you care for yourself, then you have fulfilled the intent of the Ten Commandments and the other Old Testament laws. And according to Jesus, these two commandments summarize all of it. Let them rule your thoughts, your decisions, and your actions. When you're uncertain about what to do, ask yourself which course of action demonstrates love for God and love for others. My daughters wear this bracelet. It's got H-W-L-F, which stands for He Would Love First. If you grew up in the 90s, you probably saw the WWJD bracelets. What would Jesus do? That concept, that idea, that reminder that everything that we do needs to come from this heart of who God is lived out inside of us. This needs to begin to take root within us. So these two Jewish commands that were quoted by Jesus were intentionally joined together. The Greek word agape or love seems to have been virtually a Christian invention. This form of love does not appear in this form as we understand it in the Greek anywhere in the Old Testament. It didn't come about until after the Christians, after Jesus' death and resurrection, that they're trying to communicate this love of God. And none of these other definitions really fit. And so agape was what came out of that. It's a new word for a new thing. Agape draws meaning directly from the re revelation of God in Christ. It is not a form of natural affection, but a supernatural fruit of the Spirit. It's a matter of will rather than feeling. It is a basic element of Christ's likeness. This agape, this, this love that's lived out, is unique in this context. Your love for God will be expressed by your love for people. And your love for people will be expressed by your love for God. I've told this story before, but I love it, and I felt like it fit right in. Tony Campolo tells about some homeless teenagers who, um, on these Philadelphia streets, beat to death a Korean honor student. He was doing graduate work in medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. His parents came to the U.S. for the trial, and they sat silently through this murderer's entire trial. At the end, they asked for an opportunity to speak. The guilty verdict came in, and they rose, and they knelt before the judge. Before a stunned audience, these parents begged. They begged the judge to release their son's murderers to them so that they could give the boys the home and the care that they had never had. They were Christians, and they explained to the judge that they wanted to show something of the grace that they had received from God to those who had done them so much grievous evil. Love is an action that is not focused on feelings. Because I know in that situation and in those moments, 
those words of he would love first, what would Jesus do? That would not be at the top of my heart. Any of you from the 90s remember DC Talk? A couple of you? There's a a song that they put out, Love is a Verb. So if you're not familiar with that, you can Google that later on and, and listen to that. It's super cheesy. But the message behind it, this love is an action. This love is lived out. This love first has to take root before it can do any of those things. I love C.S. Lewis, and he has a lot to say about love. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote, Do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike you will find yourself disliking him more. If you do him a good turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. Feeling follows action. Knowing what Jesus would do and working towards living that out in a way that you love someone the way that, they, the way that Jesus would love them all of a sudden our hearts began to change towards that person. Scripture, we're, we're, we're told to pray for our enemies, to love our enemies. And I can tell you when I've taken God seriously in that, when I've prayed for my enemies, my heart begins to change. Romans 5.8 tells us this, but God demonstrates His love, His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. And in 1 John 4, 9, it says, This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. And then in 1 John 4, 11, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Newspaper columnist George Crane tells of a wife who came into his office full of hatred toward her husband. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of anyone who's felt that way. We're just going to assume that there's probably times that that's been true. She says, I do not only want to get rid of him, I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he has me. Dr. Crane suggested an ingenious plan. Go home and act as if you really love your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent trait. Go out of your way to be as kind, considerate, and generous as possible. Spare no efforts to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe you love him. After you've convinced him of your undying love that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb. Tell him you're getting a divorce. That will really hurt him. With revenge in her eyes, she smiled and exclaimed, Beautiful, beautiful. Will he ever be surprised? And she did it with enthusiasm, acting as if she loved him. For two months, she showed love, kindness, listening, giving, reinforcing, and sharing. When she didn't return, the doctor called her. Are you ready now to go through with the divorce? Divorce, she exclaimed. Never. I discovered I really do love him. Her actions had changed her feelings. Motion resulted in emotion. The ability to love is established not so much by fervent promise as often in repeated deeds. J. Allen Peterson tells this story. C.S. Lewis, again, writes this. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But 
in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all dangers of love is hell. So we've looked at a couple of points here. We have begin to understand what God's concept of love is and how Jesus redefined that. We've looked too, now that I've lost my place in my notes, that God expresses his love towards us. We see this begin to unfold in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 32, and it's a familiar passage It's a passage of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property among them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son, who was in the field, when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, You are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. We see this great contrast here in this parable that Jesus tells. We see the son who is lost. We see the son who has become bitter. And we have the Father that loves them both. We need to understand how Jesus redefines love. How it's this love that is first lived out and then that takes root, that takes heart in our lives. We have to understand that that God's love is for us even if we identify as son one or son two. I don't have this in my notes, but I want, I want to look, read this to you. It's a familiar passage of Scripture, John three sixteen. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. How many of you read that for God so loved the world and you're like, yes, that's true. He loves the world. I see it. But listen to it this way. For God so loved me. For God so loved me that he gave his one and only son. I have a harder time with that one. I have a harder time identifying with the love that God has for me. I can say God loves the world. But I have a harder time wrestling with that within me. For God so loved me that he gave his one and only son for me. We have to get that part right. We have to understand the great love that God has for us. That what this season is, today as we look at this theme of love, it's what this is all about. God is revealing his character of who he is through his son, Jesus. This is who he is. Dr. Luke Deitwig writes this. During this Advent season of waiting, God waits too for us. God waits patiently as we wander, as we rebel, go our own ways, and in various forms get lost. As a loving, heavenly parent, God waits patiently for us to come to our senses, waits patiently for the eyes of our heart to be enlightened. God is there, scanning the horizon for the first glimpse of you and me, finding first sight of us. God runs wildly to welcome the returning home. As we close, you can't hardly talk about love without talking about the love chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Verses 1 through 8, it says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always persevere. Love never fails. So we know that. But when I often read through this passage, that sounds nice. But then I began to look at it and think about it in my life, and I discover my selfish response of love towards others. Because to be honest, love is inconvenient. Love has to change me in painful and awkward and uncomfortable ways. Love disrupts my life. All of these things require action. And this action of love, like Christ, comes from an encounter when Christ initiates that change in your heart. And these changes, they result externally in our lives. In other words, our actions, our words. These changes result internally in our heart, our motivation, our agenda towards others. And more importantly, 
Love changes us eternally. We have to understand God's concept of love to be able to respond to others in love. God's expressed love towards us allows us to begin this process. God's expressed love towards us allows us to understand his concept of love, which then compels us to love. I want to pray for you. As we close, we're going to invite our our kids back up here in just a second. But let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning. We confess that sometimes we don't get this right. We know that love is inconvenient and it disrupts us, it disrupts our way of life, and it disrupts our own selfish agenda. But Lord, this morning we ask that you would invade our selfishness. Father, you redefined agape, love. That love needs to be lived out, it's action. This action takes root in our heart. So Father, today, would you inconvenience us? Would you disrupt us today? Maybe for some of us, for the very first time, we also need to hear that not only do you love the world, but you gave your son for it, but you love me. You loved me. So, Father, I pray that you would help each one of us to experience that fresh and new today. That as your love transforms our hearts and our lives, that we can't help but respond outwardly as a result. Help us to get past the awkwardness, the inconvenience. And to live this love outside of ourselves. To be willing to put aside these selfish agendas and ideas. But to simply love. To love you with all that we have. And in turn love others. Father, don't let us leave here today unchanged. Invade our lives in this way, Father, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.